how do you build trust in an organization, especially when you're taking on the role of leader for the very first time with this group of individuals? If any of you have ever faced that challenge, or maybe you're on the other side, you're the team when a new leader comes in, everyone is sort of looking at each other, trying to figure each other out. Well, how do you actually build trust? Well, that's the question I pose to my guest today, Brian Kramer, who has been a leader in the automotive industry for years. He's been in the dealership, he's overseen multiple dealerships, and he shares his failures and more importantly his success is how he's built consistent teams over and over and over again by actually holding up the mirror be able to embrace the chaos and dig down deep till you find that trust at its core and then start building up your structure a stronger structure in order for your team to move forward and become more successful fascinating conversation we touch on a lot of different things we even have a few laughs which is fun because i do know brian and I really am excited for you to hear this episode. So let's dive into today's episode of You're in Charge, Now What? with Brian Kramer. Okay, Brian, first off, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so let's just jump right in. I am fascinated. Uh, I've known you now for a few years, but what I'm most fascinated about one is your honesty about your journey as a leader from taking over different you know, dealerships in various stages of success and trying to build this culture of consistency. And that's where I want to start, because I think there's people who jump into it or are assigned uh, a team and they're going this idea of culture, whatever that means. I'd rather talk about how do you help teams become more consistent? I think that's a better question to start with. So that's a great question. <clears throat> we just recently went through this with uh, an acquisition that I was involved with. And it's easy to forget, you know, regardless of how many times you go through this. And in this most recent one, and this is just a, uh, you can extrapolate it into any scenario. Mm -hmm. when, when you first acquire a new entity, there's low trust. Nobody knows what to expect right. from each other. And trust, you know, like Stephen Covey says, is the, is the glue or the WD-40 of relationships that can either make it go faster or go slower. Mm -hmm. And for instance, that, in that scenario, everybody thought that everybody had an agenda. So now you've got to size each other up. You've got to figure out, is this for real? Who's putting me together? Who's just putting on a show? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a time-consuming process. So you've got to bust all that down in order to get to true trust if you want to go fast. And if you don't have that, people are questioning everything. They're questioning, why is this happening? Well, what about the old way? They're holding on to tradition, legacy beliefs, even though they know that it's not necessarily the best way. And some of them have sunk cost bias because they built the processes themselves. So asking them to tear down what they built is, uh, they take it like a, like a you're doing, saying something negative about their child. Right. So <clears throat> so building that trust, and, and that thing is the first thing, but how do you build that, right? Because you can't have trust unless everybody's comfortable confronting each other. Mm -hmm. So what I've always done is, is go in and, and I tell everybody, look, clarity is going to be the number one, uh, one of the, you know, the core tenets of what we do here. And when I talk about clarity, it's the definition of being easily understood, remembered in a very exact, precise way is what Merriam Dictionary describes it as. So mm -hmm. if it's not, if everybody's not on the same page, which that takes a long time, if everybody, because everybody, when you say, hey, here's what we're going to do, we're going to do this and this and this. Does everybody have it? They're all going to nod their head because nobody wants to say, no, I don't, unless right. they're a strong leader, which, you know, most people don't have the confidence to say, I don't know. Right. So I think that's one of the, the core elements is to let everybody know that it's safer to say that than it is to, to have artificial harmony and omit the truth. They're not lying, but they're not also saying, hey, I, I don't know. I need to go over that again. So all of those things, and that's really you know, recently, all I've been doing is just trying to tear down those walls. If you break, and it's as simple as, and I don't preach in the choir, but that's really as simple as it is. If you can, you know, encourage trust, which is, it's not easy. No. But if you can get that to happen, everything else takes care of itself because everybody is, you know, uh, brings you their problems and they're, and they overcorrect it. Another rule that we have is a no daylight rule. And I learned that from Jim Bender, who used to be at Auto Nation, who taught it to me in a very painful way. <laughs> and all of these things I'm talking about, I explained, I've, explain to me what that means. No daylight. So no daylight would mean, so let's say you and I are working together on a project 
And I would say, uh, Glenn, to just so you know, I need to have, we need to have no daylight between the two of us. If one of the salespeople come up to you and they want to work a deal a certain way, or they want to uh, have you relook at a trade that I appraised yesterday, just keep me in the loop. So there's no daylight. Okay. Now, Got what it. happens is, you know, some people call it mom and popping and yeah. all those sorts of things, but it's, it's detrimental and it's counterintuitive because we as leaders want to help our associates. So we look at it as we're helping. And we're trying to help them along, but they're omitting certain facts that might not be to their benefit out of the equation or worst case scenario. This is what Jim told me. I had a situation where he, you know, I agreed to that with him and he kept on going into it. I said, I got it. I got it. Right. And then I learned the hard way I didn't. So <laughs> I had a, uh, an associate that was doing something they shouldn't have done. So I had suspended that person before I had time to write the report and, you know, upload it to, uh, to him. He, the associate called human resources, human resources called him and said, Hey, are you aware that Brian Kramer did this? No, because that's impossible. Cause we, he and I have a no daylight rule. And so then he called me up and he said, Hey, did you, I said, yeah, I was just about to call you, you know, and it, and it got very passionate from there. So yes. I knew that was an out of bounds <laughs> marker, <clears throat> but the interesting thing was, is he said, okay, now you, you get to go through the process of everybody questioning everything, even though I believe you, it's going to be four or five hours taken away from your day from this hijack because I'm not going to lie to my team and say, oh, I did know about that when I didn't because because right. you didn't tell me. He said, all you had to do was tell me so I didn't get blindsided and, every, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. You would have five hours back tomorrow. So every time you have daylight between you and I, he goes, now I could have, if you would have called me, I would have said, oh yeah, he just called me. Not a big deal. I'm in the loop. Don't worry about it. Right. Problem solved. And there's so many examples that I see every single day because most people say, why do I want to bring up a problem if we don't know for sure it's a problem? Let's roll the dice and right. like, you know, maybe my odds are 50 50 rather than, you know, Wendell Hardy, uh, who you and I worked together for the longest time. But, you know, we that's a core tenant of what we do is no daylight with everybody. It's OK to make a mistake. It's OK. Hey, just so you know, in case it comes up and he tells me four or five things daily that never come to fruition and maybe one out of those per week ends up becoming an issue but i'm never surprised never blindsided right now <clears throat> I, I agree with you i think that is really important for one if you are the leader or if you're a number two or on a team you know there is that communication and i think there's a lot in there to unpack but that that idea of well i don't want to bother brian with this i'll take care of that that's not what the leaders saying to you, the leader is saying, just keep me looped. I'm not going to get in your way, go do it. But for some reason, if on that one instance, I know something that you don't, and that could color that decision. Well, now you're giving me the opportunity to save us all time because I could give you that feedback. Um, one thing you started with, and I wanted to, to clarify, uh, you know, expand on it because as I said, there's a lot in there in the beginning, this idea of trust. I think from my perspective, because I've done it, I jokingly say I've taken mediocre teams and made them great, taking great teams, made them mediocre. A lot of those times is because I think I can skip steps, right? And I jump in, and I start making decisions without taking the time to explain something. And you use the word clarity. But the other word I hope everyone heard was do. Here's what we're going to do. You just didn't give them a concept. You said, here's what we're going to do action so we all know very clear on what we're talking about so walk me through that give me a couple examples of how do you build trust in that opening you know call it 30 days you know walk me through some examples because again i like to have tactical things for the audience to take away from this so when when i first got to let's say the, the toyota store you got everybody in the room Here's what's going to be most important, clarity, consistency, cadence of accountability, called in the three C's. Uh, this is how we're going to move forward. This is the reality. I know that everybody says that this isn't a problem. That's not a problem. But here's the math. Here's where we rank relative to everybody else. That's just the data, uh, and it doesn't lie. It's not emotionally attached to anything. Mm -hmm. Just Let's just agree that it is what it is. Now, here's the lead measures from uh, four disciplines of execution that affect those lag measures. And so here's what we need to focus on appointments and really appointments shown, you know, cause we, there was a huge emphasis on calls and how much activity you could generate. Right. And there's a lot of different, you know, 
opinions on that. And whichever one it is, I think that the consistency should trump everything. But I don't, I'm not into having my associates with a bunch of activity. And I would tell them, because you got to make some deposits before you make the withdrawal. So you guys are making all these calls. Do you think these calls are effective? Of course, there's no trust, so they don't tell you the truth. And I'm like, okay, well, if you're not going to say it, I don't think that everybody that we're calling here needs to be called. I think we need to remove some of these from the planner. So they think it's a setup. But I said, we're going to take care of this and this and this. Now let's talk about what the non-negotiables are. Non-negotiables are you're going to have you know two shown appointments or two set appointments per day minimum, at least one show. Right. And in order to do that, if you're that much more skilled on the phone, you can do it in eight calls or two calls or 22 calls. That's That benefits you like a technician would by turning more hours. But no matter what, we, we all need to agree before we leave this room that that's the lead measure. And know that when we you agree to that, you're also making me a promise. And we're putting rings on each other's fingers because don't tell me you're going to do something and then not do it. It's okay to you know debate it in here, but once we leave this room, don't tell me you didn't understand, you didn't have clarity, and we'll stay in here for the next eight hours if necessary. But there will be swift consequences if not. So take that seriously. It's not just because I'm removing all that other stuff so we can just focus on these drivers. These are right. a condition of employment, right? So <clears throat> once we agree on that, everybody's not understanding the severity of it, obviously. So then there's got to be some other things tied to it, but there's got to be some sort of consensus. But we break down the three the three kinds of trust because people, and this might go a little bit deep into the weeds, but I think no, it's really important. Fine, fine. So you've got personal trust. Personal trust is the repeated experience of you caring and listening. Mm -hmm. Do they care about you as a leader? Do you care about them as a person, as a as an associate? Truly, do you do you have regret if you didn't do what you were supposed to do for them, and now they can't provide for their family because you didn't document it, you didn't take, do progressive discipline? corrective action. And now all of a sudden they're getting blindsided because right. our enterprise says, why is this person still here selling five cars a month? They can't be here. Oh yeah, I agree. And then all of a sudden that person gets, you know, silently taking out back and they didn't have a chance to improve, which is the whole purpose of corrective action. Yes. So they need to know that you trust, that they trust you, you trust them. Then you've got technical trust, which is you know, everybody get confuses these three, right? So technical trust is, is the repeated experience of you helping get things done, solve problems and getting better. Are you learning your product? Do you know your job? But that doesn't mean that you're ethically and morally trusted. You know, that's just your good right. at your job. So do I trust that you're competent? If I bring you a deal, are you going to be able to get it approved? It's much right. different than personal trust. And then you've got ethical trust, which is repeated experience of your integrity and motives. So ethical trust builds character, personal trust builds connection, technical trust builds con competence. So those three is what the building blocks of, uh, of trust are. And it's, it's important because people, a lot of people think that if they have technical trust, that's all they need. You know? Right. And for and, some, and listen, <clears throat> for some organizations that may be the most important driver. Uh, of that. But what I love about what you said, and again, I hope audience you're listening to this is, I love that example of we're going to talk about the facts, right? It's not there's no emotions layered on top. These are not good, bad and different. These are just the numbers. And then here are actions that we're going to do. And what I loved about what you did is you removed actions that could be debated in terms of their effectiveness what you drove you you went a, one step further out and said here's what we need we need to have these two markers or this one in your example two appointments and one shows up right so we could do what we do how you get there that's up to you and that again is where that technical trust comes in where if it's taking you forever to do it or you're not achieving it well it's my job as your leader to help you with the technical trust and start working on your skills and figuring out what's going on and how can i help you and what 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 obstacles can i remove so then that in turn builds the personal trust because you care enough to be here right and then it's also the ethical trust because I can look you straight in the eye and say, we've tried this multiple times. It, this may not be a job for you, but the person can shake your hand and say, well, at least we both tried. And so I think that's a really good example because many people focus on the minutia tasks and set a number on that and stand over people with this minutia that 
people may not think is 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 right. And what I also liked about what you said was you as a leader knew what they were probably thinking. This is where you're a good leader. I already know that they hate this. Let me be the one and remove it. And they go, oh, he just removed that. So I think there's so much in there, but I love those three levels of trust because they do like levers all interact with each other to really break down barriers and build up a stronger structure. And it's so important. We tell them that we're going to reinforce it. And here's the deposit we're going to make for them, mm. which still have now it happens like clockwork, but it's very hard to implement. The managers, because of all the work they're putting in, the least that we can do is we can confirm every single appointment and we can call everyone that didn't show. Right. Those are the two drivers because the people aren't showing. There's something causing that. And if they're uh, a point, you know, the, the confirmation, what everybody knows and they have personal and ethical trust in the managers, they know that they're going to confirm them through repeated actions. If we don't right. repeatedly confirm them, then they start questioning, well, it must not be that important because if it was, they would confirm them. And if they're not going to spot check it, they're not going to know that this is a smoke appointment. So when you ratchet it down, that's how you get true, a true cadence of accountability daily. So then on that point where I see a lot of businesses, I've been in multiple industries, and where I see there's a breakdown, what we've been talking about is helping those frontline people. But then that ma that person who's in charge, the manager, whatever title they have, there's not either we haven't built it into their work plan where actually, you know, I was speaking to someone the other day on one of the episodes and we said, you know, as you move up, some of your job is more inspection and accountability versus doing their job. But do you see a lack of training for that person? right? There's an assumption that because they're in that position, they understand this, but who's doing that consistent development for that person? It, do, do you see that as a lack in business? It's a, it's a systemic problem throughout our whole industry because we focus on the technical aspects of it rather than the personal aspects of it. And we don't teach, and I, and I will say this, and I already, I can tell that's probably where you're going, but I'll take the bait because it's juicy. <laughs> the there's going to be a massive amount of turnover when this market loosens up when the inventory does come back and that levy breaks and we go back to minis and we go back to all the things that we all know are going to happen and nobody wants to think past the end of this month but when that does happen many are not going to be prepared for it living it should be building a stone you know a brick house right now but living in a straw house and when that wave comes in a, a lot of people are nice and comfortable at the golf course and doing whatever it is that they do or not or not guarding those processes right now and they're going to get woken up and i think that when at when the, in the melee of all of that what's going to emerge is it's going to be less about uh you know, wizardry and f and i and how, who can desk the most i mean right now we're all one price right and it's just so everybody should be honing their leadership skills because when this is done, at some point, F and I and sales managers are going to become one, and there's going you know technology is just going right. to allow for it to happen, and then it's going to come down to leadership development, coaching, accountability. That's going to be the whole deal, and that's what everybody in this industry will pay big money for because the technology will do a lot of this uh, stuff that is tribal knowledge from you know here to there to there, but the most pressing thing out of what you just said, in my opinion, is we assume that the managers do that. Most managers, you know, let's just call it what it is. We all have big egos and none of us want to raise our hand and say that we don't know, especially right. when we got into a situation, you just try to fake it till you make it. So, and no, they don't ask for, for help. Or you were good at what you did. And a lot of times you're promoted to, you know, for instance, we're talking sales. I'm a great salesperson. That does not make me a great sales leader or a manager. And, and the point is, is that I think then it ties into, I know product, I know what I did to be successful, but that may not scale across your whole team where all of a sudden you have people of varying skill sets. Uh, and I think that's a huge uh, uh, missing training because we don't put those people through training. I know you went to the Disney Institute, I believe, but we don't have that where we're sending someone who's now in charge of a team to go learn how to coach people and develop people. That's a whole other skill set than doing the job that you're, you, you know, you're now running. 
completely different skill sets. And to your point is they're not going to raise their hand and say, well, I don't know. They're going to try and fake it or do what my previous boss did. And that may or may not be successful because I had this note and I'll throw it by you is that I've seen many times where people are successful right? They, even if they leave a dealership or a business and they go somewhere else, they're successful because of that structure they were in, but they may not know how to build a structure, right? They were successful because that structure was there, but there's a whole completely different skill set to go out and build a structure. I've seen many times where people just fail because they don't have that. So it, it, to your point is we need to build those skills up in these managers because there are going to be a lot of changes. And for the audience who didn't understand some of what we were just talking about, maybe is that right now, individuals are making a lot of money selling less cars than in the past, or less product. So maybe they sell 10, they used to have to sell 20 to generate the same income. Well, that may happen again. But if all you did was sell 10 and make all of this money, the idea that I now have to sell 20, there's going to be changes and you have to really cope through that. And if you as a leader don't have that skill set in your toolkit, going to be messy and when the when it does turn i know that i actually prefer it to be more disruptive because it puts our team at a competitive advantage because they're mentally conditioned for that right. so when everything like at the beginning of COVID, when everything was chaotic and nobody knew what to do we just leaned into it and you know everybody said what are we going to do i said you already know what to do we've been training for this for years now we're going to go grab market share we're right. going to advertise when nobody else is advertising we're going to go aggressive when everybody else is pulling back and one thing that I think we go back to trust and, and as you're talking about the structure and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, it's you, you really got my brain spinning. I think it comes down to if you if you structure it, <clears throat> one of the most important things, and it's a detriment mostly to GMs, and GSMs, they're the ones that commit the crime. I was one of them. Uh, you don't provide role clarity. So right. many dealerships have three, four sales managers sitting behind a sales tower doing the same thing. So somebody, so a salesperson comes up, let's say it's a new, you know, less than six month uh, in the business salesperson. They're all gonna work deals differently. They're all gonna have their own style. Who knows what the one person is gonna give one trade value and one person is gonna give a different one. Right. I know how much this thing's gonna sell for. I don't care what that data says. I'm gonna put this much in it, watch me do this. And, uh, and then they lose five grand. But the point of all of that is what's not happening you know, because we went through this in multiple stores that I was in, you know, I would get frustrated, angry because right. they weren't confirming the appointments. They weren't calling the no shows, but I wasn't giving them clarity as to whose responsibility it was. And then right. just like we were talking about with the uh, commitment meeting at the end of the day at five o'clock, who, you know, I'm going to call, who am I going to call and who's going to, or who's going to text me how many uh, appointments that we set or how many were confirmed. They better be a hundred percent. And how many of the no shows didn't follow up and then at the end of the night at nine o'clock or whenever they get out of there how many cars did we sell so that nobody loses sight of the most important things how many cars mm -hmm. did we sell how much money did we make how many appointments do we have for tomorrow every single day and it never stops and you know serious repercussions of those little small things because i'm like you're saying removing all these things and i'm not going to make you do this and this and all these other things that you said weren't impactful we're going to narrow it down to two or three and those two or three they're non-negotiables. They became your structure. But what I loved about that, and you know, when I, when I was working in a previous job, that's what I would do. I would come up to them and I would say, "Okay, Brian, what's on your plate today? What are you What are you working on?" And then they'd say, "This, this, this." Or I'd ask them in the beginning because they would say, "Well, I don't know what you're looking for." So I listed three or four things every time till eventually I walked up to them and they would spout those three or four things. But they knew every day I was coming. It was a non-negotiable. Why? Because that was on my checklist. That was my job to go ask the questions. And, and I had someone one time say, you know, it, using you, Brian's worked for you two years. Why do you still ask him that? I said, because it's my job. The minute I stop doing that, Brian doesn't think that's important anymore. And it becomes this trickle down effect versus to your point is I'm calling you with these questions or text me these every night. That's just something. And if you're not here, right. Someone should have stepped in to handle those duties because it's not your job. It's not Brian's job. It's whatever role title person is. So when they leave, someone steps in because we still have to send it to Brian because that's the 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 role in this 
in this business, you know, and that's where I think to your point is it becomes uh, a very personality driven business. And more importantly, it's always the, it, it always sits with you. So you are the general manager. If you leave, it's, it's not you. You're not the general manager. The way I explained is you're fulfilling those duties. If you go on vacation, someone has to step in to do those duties so that the machine runs while you're on vacation. And I think that's another thing that's missing in, in your idea of role clarity. It's not me, it's the role. And whether I'm doing it, you're doing it, someone else is doing it, we have to follow that checklist in order to be as you're saying, you've said it multiple times, consistent, because consistency is going to breed that culture of success. No, you nailed it. And we, for a long time, and it was mostly because I would get frustrated because I wasn't providing clarity. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, at one point used cars, I was, you know, putting all the pressure on one manager about pricing. And, and it, then it, everything was important. So nothing was right. Right. So I, That's a good I point. Said, Here's the only things that are non-negotiables pricing cars you know twice a week uh merchandising and comments uh daily trade walk appointment confirmations and no shows and uh appraisals you know just the activity of it so we did a depth chart just like you would on a, any sports team specifically football you know you've typically got a one through four mm -hmm. uh, roster <clears throat> so it doesn't necessarily mean that this person over here just slides into that who is the best appraiser that we have? Because we're going to put our chips on whoever's the most consistent and has right. the least uh, error margin. Who's the best at pricing? Who's the best at this? So if that person goes down, this is the two slot they move over. So, and we posted it and, and it was clear. So if somebody got sick and they were the one that was, and that's another thing, you know, I, in a, in a fit of rage, you know, took the computers out of the sales tower and the chairs and, on a Saturday one time, because everybody kept sitting there just out of habit. And I said, look, there's gonna be one person desking deals. We're selling 500 cars a month. That's because you're too distracted with all this other stuff. If I, if you just do everything we're supposed to do, there should only be one person. That's crazy. But you know what happens when you have one person, everybody does it one way and everybody brings right. their stuff up because it's so busy, like a Chick-fil-A. When you mm -hmm. get up to the drive-through, you're already got your order ready because you know, it's going to be fast because they're fast. So you got to right. keep up. And it's the same philosophy with desking deals. You don't need to have tell, it's not story time. You know, uh, what do you need? Here's the needs analysis. I need a first pencil. That's really, you shouldn't know where they want to be price-wise, payment-wise. You should only know they want this car. They like this. They would like lane keep assist, you know, blind spot monitor. Right. And what do they want to accomplish today? They want to buy a car. See what I love, but there's again, folks, I hope you're listening and I hope you, I always say, I hope you go back and listen multiple times. I love that idea of the depth chart because I don't, see it. I don't see it a lot. I see it all about one person. That's the role, right? In your case, that's the used car manager. And I always would ask them, well, who's the backup? And they look at me like I'm crazy. And I said, well, what happens if he's sick or she's sick? They're out. They go on vacation. Does that mean that no one does? Oh, and you know what? The Are you trying to replace me? <laughs> well, what they'll say is more, oh, well, uh, the, the general manager just do it, like, or somebody else will do it. Like, it's uh, some mystery on top of everybody else's job. We're going to do this versus saying, no, I'm going to step into this role. Well, now somebody takes over my duties in my previous role for the day or two, right? And it becomes this shifting of the duties versus lumping everything on someone's plate, just adding on and adding on. Because when we add on, we didn't add on more time. So what happens is we do it faster and we skip a few things just to do check our box off. So we don't get yelled at because we say, well, we did it. Did we do it? Great. Probably not because we didn't have the time to focus. I think that's a real skill that a lot of times people are just missing. And, and, and when you said it just makes so much sense to have your depth chart gets everybody in their lanes. They can play their game. You know, like you said, sports, I'm the tackle. I'm doing the tackle's job, not the center's job, not the quarterback's job. This is my job. Now, if they move me and say, somebody got hurt, I need you to move over to guard. Well, I do guard stuff now for a while, not tackle stuff, right? I think that that's where you can plug and play. And more importantly, I think you're more successful because everyone knows the role. So initially, and I've never, I've never talked, had this conversation publicly like this, um, we can go deep. So, so we call that at the dealership a diffusion of responsibility. Mm, so like when you've that. got 
two people like that, like that used car manager we're describing, imaginary, and this other manager, what happens is you can't hold either one of them accountable. Because you're like, well, we missed the number. Well, hey, it's all, you know, we all own it. It's all, we share the wins, we share the losses, but it's really not like that in sports, right? You know, you missed your assignment. So typically what happens is when there's a diffusion of responsibility, it's because there's low trust, technical trust, or what, you know, it, and it's typically technical in that scenario. They trust yes. the person ethically, they're an honest person. They just can't run that fast. I'm going to cover for them. I got them. And then that person doesn't have a chance to get better. So what happens is this. You know, I'll give you an example of, of uh, what happened at the dealership at one point. So I'm looking, I'm sitting there watching everything go down, losing my mind. And <laughs> I'm like, why are you submitting these deals? Well, because the F&I uh, guys helped me out with confirming appointments. But that's not what we agreed to on the depth chart, right? You're going to confirm the appointments. They're going to do that. Well, he couldn't figure out how to get this thing in the system. Well, that's because, you know, the salesperson didn't follow the process. So now you're trying to manually override that. Right. So since you're doing that, now you've got to do that. He's now doing your job and you're doing that. Why? Well, I don't trust that he is going to be able to figure it out. Okay. Time out, pull the on down cord. That's, you know, and that's what most people aren't willing to do at that point. It's time to, you know, do a timeout because you're about to have a turnover and yes. every, the whole line needs to stop at that point. And that it typically the adrenaline, the endorphins are rushing. So most people won't do it, but that's a critical error. And as I started looking at it, so, you know, we're to do this, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. Then it comes down to technology, which is what has been a secret, uh, I don't know, you know, secret sauce at our dealership. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, here, we'll make it real simple. Now my gentlemen at the desk have all been an F and I, uh, one of them has been a director turned off their ability to uh, submit deals and pull credit. They're losing their mind because they know deal structure as well as anybody. And I said, it's not about the deal structure. It's about you being focused. I'm holding right. you accountable, not them accountable for these, for these appointments. That's not their job. They're not to do that. Their deal. Yeah, but they don't know deal structure. Well, they better get better or I'm going to hold them accountable and I'm going to give them an opportunity to improve. And we had to write up three quarters of the F&I team when that happened. And they all figured out how to hang their own paper. They all got better and they had to go home and study. And, and they're all, almost all of those right. individuals are directors now. But see, to that right there is so important because as you said, sometimes, sometimes leaders in your position, as you said, you were there, you saw your folks going to run into the wall and you let them run into the wall. A lot of times we don't let them run into the wall because we want to save it. Or in that scenario, if nobody was watching, you may get the report and say, hey, we had a great day because you're not seeing the chaos where people are helping. And I always call it, it you're creating dependency. Well, if I don't get to it, I know Brian's going to help me out and cover. Well, then to your point is there's no incentive for me to get better. And then number two is, it doesn't allow you in the leadership position to know what I need to train on. I always call it targeted training. So now I know just stay in your lane if they're going to, yeah, but we are going to miss our mark. Yeah, we might miss it today, but in the long term, we'll be better for it. And more importantly, you're not going to get mad at that person and get frustrated. And you're, as you said early on, that personal trust is going to diminish because you say, well, wait a minute, you're getting paid X and I'm doing half of your job. I hate rah, 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 rah. Versus just let it go, stay in your lane, and we'll work on it. And if they can't get better, then we'll die trying, trying to make them better. But if they can't, then we're going to find out they shouldn't be in that position. But then the team wins versus exhaustion, everything else like that. And I love that. And folks, if you're listening to that, again, go back and listen to what that was. You have to sometimes let people fail so you know what to train them on so they won't fail in the future. And if you don't, typically the top performers that are carrying the other ones, because if you have a diffusion of responsibility, you can't hold them accountable. No. And you'll get frustrated as a leader and the top performers will leave. Yes. And it's not going to be the bottom performers. No, because they're, they're the bottom performers are the ones that are actually being helped. And then the top performers are looking at you as a leader and saying, why am I doing this? Isn't this your job to fix this? The problem is the top performers because they're helping for the team to win. And it's, and again, it's counterintuitive. Well, are you telling me you want us to fail and miss our number? 
no, I want you to do your job so I can figure out who's not doing their job right now. Everybody's covering for everybody. And it is that, you know, lack it's it's an honestly it's a lack of trust for you because you're afraid to let somebody else fail and i get it it's your teammate but at the end of the day you're gonna leave if you have to make a choice yes i'd rather miss the number and fix the problem yes absolutely and too often we don't do that let me uh pivot for a moment on this because again there was something else that you were talking about um and, and you, what I've always admired about you since I've known you is you have a one foot in reality, meaning, and I don't mean it so, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll rephrase that. <laughs> Some people but think there's two feet out of reality. I, I, that could be. It's that one foot of reality, meaning you have a good sense of what's going on today and how to keep that consistent, right? Well, everything we've been talking about, keeping today consistent, keeping the machine moving forward. But you also have another foot or an eye down the road to sort of what's coming next. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how do you, one, how do you see down the road, right? Some people have their head down all the time. And then how do you start building that next step or talk about it in a way or convince people that that's the direction we have to go when we're so successful here they they may not want to move they may not want to shift but talk to me a little bit about that because it's an interesting thing you always do you you as i said you have your success but you're always where are we going okay i've never asked that question before but that's a uh, that's a heavy one so one thing is obviously I want to focus on where it's going almost to a to a fault right so i've also got to make sure that i've got a left tackle that's airtight so that I can look downfield right. and try to find an open receiver. <clears throat> so the first piece of it, because I know a lot of people are like, how do you find the time? It's a, it's very easy to find the time when you focus first on solidifying the left side of your offensive line. Right. You know, in my, my case was my management team and we all talked about it and they know that if they let a customer get to me and sack me, if they, if they create daylight, which causes problems, <clears throat> then they, I get sacked and I can't stay in the pocket and throw down field. Right. So we talked about that ad nauseum. So we would always, every six months, and actually used to be in the Saturday meetings before COVID, coming soon to a dealership near you. And we would talk about the next exciting things that were coming out and if there was interest right. or not. And then we would get a small little Skunk Works team. Okay, here's what we're thinking. What about this? Does this make sense? Is there ROI? And then we would just talk about legacy beliefs where it's going Mm -hmm. and we would always have a way in the future what should it look like uh vision and then we we posted it it would be a wallpaper in the conference room on the on the monitor or whatever okay so does that align with that if we want to go simple fast easy what if is adding more preloads on the addendum going to get us closer to that or further away right so because a lot of times it comes down to this short-term profitable item Mm-hmm. that might charging over sticker on um, non G wagons or something like that. You know, does that simplify our process or make it more complicated? I've had so many different products presented to us that don't sim- which I stole from you guys, right? Simple, fast, easy, but right. If, if I, if it doesn't align with that, that's like a halo for everything we do. If it doesn't align with that, we say no to so many profitable ideas that would make us a, a lot of money to stay true to that. Cause we know who we are. So, right me not deviating from that ethical trust and that personal trust on that if i did they would really get weirded out and they would you know what are we doing that's not aligned with our core values that's not part of our culture and it's also okay for them to call me out which they do frequently good and that that's a sign of a great team and i i just want to point out again folks listening to what you just said is that you need to have that North star. You need to whatever, however you want to, uh, I, I always said you and I talked about this one time is saying, how do I want my customers to feel when they're done doing business with us and then work backwards? What do I ha- we have to do to do that? How do we build out a process? So it's consistent. Then we go find those people to do that. Then we go find the tech that can help us do that. So then anytime some change comes or someone presents you a new tech or a new this or a new that you go back and look and say, 
Does it align? Is this a replacement for something? Is this an add-on? And then you go, well, how are we going to do that? And how do we put it in place? And how long is it going to take? And who owns this and the responsibility? But still, I even with looking down the road, it's still tied to that because is this going to help us accomplish whatever that is and still align versus, well, if we do that, yeah, I see it down the future, but it's going to completely put our company at risk for what we've built in terms of brand, in terms of core values, that ethics. Yes, we can make money, but it completely contradicts what we want. So I really like that always going back to your North Star. And then we always share stories. Every single team member, you know, on Saturday mornings, what's a good experience that you had? What's, uh, you know, we talk about the wins, we talk about and we remind them of the basics, you know, what got us to this point. So they don't lose sight of that left tackle theory. Right. right. So, you know, oh, you sold 22 cars last month. You sold 24 cars. What was the secret? And every single time, every single week, well, I just stuck to the basics and I just focused and I just, you know, blocked out the noise. Okay. No secret closes, no right. slick word tracks. No, no. I just really just came to work to work. But okay. see, that's yeah. a really th a good thing, again, that a lot of managers don't do is we focus so much on when we fail, right? Then we right. got to go fix things versus, and, and even in failure, this is another little side thing from management, is that not everybody failed, right? If we, if we did as a group missed our number, whatever it was, if I looked at it, everybody's individual goals, probably half of my team exceeded what they were, their personal goal. Well, why am I dragging all them down? Right. And we're just, everybody is, and they're sitting there going, I did really well. So same thing on the flip side is just because you hit your number doesn't mean everybody was successful on personally. And more importantly, what I loved about it is what you said was, what did you do to be successful. So I could, what behavior? So I can repeat it. And by getting them to say, no, I just did, I came in every day and I made my number of calls or I was very organized and I did my follow up and I did this. And you basically are saying, great, do it again. Right. Because it worked to everybody. Was, exactly. And then you can go work with the people who didn't. Well, what didn't you do? Or what did you, oh, you're in the wrong direction again. Let me get you back on. It goes back to that targeted training that you were talking about earlier. And then we all talk about a positive experience. If somebody comes back from vacation, welcome back. Tell me about the experience at the, at the hotel check-in. That's know. so <clears throat> smart. So smart. And anything, you know, who, who bought a, an Apple device lately? Did you buy it online? Did you buy it in the store? Walk us through that experience. You know, right. Who had a family member that bought a car recently? Where did they buy it? What, yeah, what was call? their experience? Because what you're doing there for them is reminding them they're consumers. And so now you're taking it out of automotive and you're saying, okay, oh, I had a great time at this restaurant. What did they do? Because maybe there's something they physically did that we might be able to do. Because if you liked it, our customers like, or more importantly, if you hated it, a horrible experience. Great, what did they do? Or what didn't they do that made you feel that way? Are we doing that? Are we at risk of doing that? Could we potentially be doing that? I think going outside of, our, uh, of any industry, and bringing things in good and bad and as using it as a mirror to what you're currently doing. Again, phenomenal. Very, very smart. I told about a story when I was on an airplane going to a Toyota meeting last year. And while I was up in the air, uh, I realized that I forgot my AirPods at, uh, at Midway on the, at where I was eating lunch or whatever on the layover. So I'm panicking because I've got, <laughs> I don't know how many different calls and, and, you know, I need them. So I'm looking online and using the, the plane Wi-Fi. I order a pair and I'm like, okay, what? how long is it gonna take me to get an Uber to get from Mandalay Bay down to the forum shops uh, you know, on the strip? Right. And then it said, would you like to have them delivered to you? So I'm like, okay, what time am I gonna be delivered? No, I'm 30,000 feet up in the air <laughs> and I'm conducting a transaction on AirPods, these AirPods, and I place the order. Okay, when will you be there? The person's gonna you know, show up. And I literally hadn't even checked in. I was in line to check in. The person calls me. They were they walked right into the lobby, complete the transaction, perfect, charged, ready to go. Now, so I told them at that point, I paid, I think nine or twelve dollars for the delivery fee, but I would have paid a hundred dollars sure. to have that level of service because it was a I me. Mean, my time was so stretched at that moment, and and we're all busy. 
But when I take them and I insert them in, they're like, wow. I go, so imagine the wow factor. Do you think that I would feel, I said, I tip the guy. Do I feel like giving him grief about grinding up on what's his invoice and what's his price? Absolutely not. That's right. above and beyond service. And not, I paid him more than what, even though you know they got plenty of margin, I paid him more because it was exceptional service. Absolutely. And I think to that point is having that discussion and saying, where in our customer interaction <clears throat> Could we apply that, right? So it could be, hey, when you take the person's car, put their seat settings back to where they were when you're handing it to them or reset the radio. How many times have I gotten in a car and all of a sudden I'm going, what the heck is this station, right? And everything's out of whack. And, you know, those types of things or uh, walking them out to their car instead of, oh, it's parked three, you know, all of or we all complain things. that we don't have enough used cars and somebody calls to say, ask what their car is worth and we give them an answer. But why, why don't we say, well, where do you live? You're 10 minutes away. How about I just come out to you? And exactly. Just... Exactly. Because that's who you're competing against. Or as you've been a big proponent of, give them an answer and that's it. There is no, well, maybe if I have to do all these things or if you bring it down, why are we making it hard? And I think that really is the mantra of constantly looking at all of your interactions and saying, have we gotten a little sloppy Right. So, so I always say there's two things. It's execution of the process and the process. So are you executing well? Well, if you are executing at a hundred and it's still not good, well, let's look at the process. Or if we have a great process, we don't know if it's good or bad because we're not executing, right? We have to work on those, those two things, but I love everything you're saying about looking outside the industry and, and then holding that mirror up um, and learning and from the, everyone else. Selling the associates on the why, which you know, I've, I've violated many times in the past and, you know, everybody always hammers, you know, we need email capture. We need 98% email capture, which really should be a hundred percent because flip phones are now extinct because 3G right. they plug on it. So there's no excuse not to get an email address. Well, this, you know, he's an elderly customer, you know, our Lincoln store has 92% uh, email capture and a hundred percent connected services. So it's all just a myth, but the point of it is being is this, I, I would ask all the salespeople, like, do you realize what happens when you don't get a valid email or you just use, you know, uh, Brian Kramer at gmail.com? It's going to some Brian Kramer, but it's not me because I, I wish I had that email. Right. But but when you do that or whatever, B Kramer at Comcast, you know, it's not, or B Kramer, whatever uh, one code they all use to, because they don't feel like exactly. asking for it. <clears throat> if we're going to retarget, you need the mobile number. We need the email address, we need their name, we need a physical address so we can sit there and build a profile and do the Oracle stuff, Facebook custom audiences, all those things that, that you know, but they, I find that they don't know. And they're like, wait, what is this now? Oh yeah. So all of our marketing is based on that. Tens and t or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if you don't get that data, we just pass over you when we're doing our custom audience. So your clients aren't gonna get marketed to. So if I told you right. that I'll give you $2,000 personally, to, to advertise with and I'll market you on Facebook and Google, you would say, Oh, what do I need to do? Well, really all you need to do is get email, a valid cell phone number, exactly. and you're part of that club. But if not, this person's getting, we're going to spend that much. That person's getting their unfair share and you're getting none. So is it still worth that to you? And that, as I kept on using a cattle prod and in, in, in a hammer on everybody's hand, you know, scolding them and yelling at them when i explained had jared come in and explain that up on the screen as to exactly what it is he does and how he does it we didn't have to really talk about that a lot after well so again for those of you listening again i like pulling off stopping a little bit and focusing on this that idea goes back to what you said earlier is role clarity right if you don't understand why you're doing something then you don't realize how it impacts others. As I said, I was having a conversation on an, another episode about this. And the the gentleman who I was interviewing said, if if someone, let's say, in your in your finance department or in your accounting department doesn't understand uh, why they do their job, they then they have no sense of urgency to one, get the reports done at a certain period of time or what, because they don't know, well, if if you're, the reports are late to me, then I can't do this, or I can't do this, and I can't do this. But once they understand how their little piece in their mind, oh, it's not that important. Everything's important because everybody has a role to move the machine forward. And if somebody lags for some reason, it impacts so many people, but they don't know that 
until you tell them that. And then most people will say, oh, I didn't know that. Of course, I'll do that for, for the team. We just assume they know. And I, I, I don't think we can spend time over communicating the importance of each role and how it connects to someone else and why it's important for you to deliver on time. Um, and more importantly, what happens and how it sl slows everything down when we don't deliver on time. <clears throat> what you just described happened to us last week. So the accounting department uh, came to leadership and said that the F&I team doesn't care about accounting. I'm like, well, why would you say that? Because that wasn't my perception. Right. Well, because they don't turn their receipts in. So they hold them in their offices. They don't give them to us, which I know what that causes. So bring in the offenders. And some of them have been with us for less than a year or promoted within the last year. Right. And I, and I said, do you, want, do, you know, do you know why it's so important that you get these receipts in before midnight and get them in the safe and you make sure that in CDK you, you do the ACC rec, uh, you know, receipt for the reconciliation? Well, no. And then they started saying, well, no, let me tell you what happened. I was here with this client. I'm like, I don't need to know that. Do you know the right. reason why that affects them? <laughs> and no, is the, you know, the abbreviated right. answer of that 20 minute conversation. So then we get to the point and I said, they come in at seven o'clock in the morning or six 30. And if that hasn't been done, they sit because they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So they wait and they wait and hopefully you show up at eight 30, but typically it's going to be nine right before the meeting. And then you're in the meeting sales meeting you know, contributing, adding value, then they're still screaming. waiting. They're yeah. still waiting. <laughs> and they said, where is that? Oh, hold on. I'll go get it right now. You had it in there the whole time. And <clears throat> they don't realize that that's when their day. So they sit there three hours idle because they can't start their day for the for reconcile the day until they have that. Oh, I had no idea to your point. Right. So now, and they kept on fighting it. Oh, they're just giving me a hard time. Why are they nitpicking me? And accounting thinks that they're the devil and vice versa, when in right. actuality, we just didn't pull the curtain back. Right. And you didn't explain it. And a lot of times, a lot of disagreements in business or between departments comes from the fact that they don't know what the other team did. We addressed this during COVID, where we would have our staff meeting or our team, you know, whole team meeting on Mondays. And what we would say is we're going to take 15 minutes out of this every other week and each department's going to explain to everyone else what they do and how it connects and all of a sudden people said well oh i didn't realize they did this or i didn't understand how they did that that's pretty cool oh i see how my department interacts with them we broke down a lot of those barriers uh thank goodness in, in you know because it did come up a little bit and we said well here's a solution and so we do that we still do it, maybe not as often now because most of the people have been with us for a while, but as new people come in, we have them meet with the other departments and meet with the other people and say, here, spend some time with me. Let me show you what I do. And it, it, it creates that bond amongst the team. I think that's really important and key. Um, listen, man, I could talk to you forever on this. Look at this time just flies. Um, so um, as we wrap up, I, I usually ask five questions that are just fun, quick, I call them the one so that you just answer very quickly. So, uh, or what comes to your mind? So the first question I love asking people because I'm really curious for you. So, so I'm fascinated. My son, 16, 17 in that, you know, 10th, 11th grade, there's a lot of transformation with people in during that time. So if I said to you, if you look backwards to Brian Kramer, 16, 17 year old, what's the trait that's still consistent something that's still consistent. You say, yep, it was there. It's still here. That's the first part. Second part is the reverse. If that 16, 17 year old sees you now, what's the thing that would most surprise them? So the thing that is, is still there, I would say is um, tenacity or, or drive. That's what's mm -hmm. allowed me to get through this significant amount of adversity that I've been through mm -hmm. uh, and not tap out sometimes to a fault what is no longer there is the blaming uh blaming circumstances blaming others uh blaming situations not taking ownership not confronting people head on um you know hinting and hoping that they're going to know what i'm talking about without just telling them looking them in the eye and just telling them what is going on and uh, 
So it sounds like this idea of accountability, personal accountability, and also the ability to, to hold others accountable uh, and have that confidence, it sounds like, in yourself. And not trying to outwork. There's a, you know, I wish I just learned here recently, but I used to just think there was a limitless amount of time and I could just make up for it by working more. And next thing you know, instead of working an eight hour day or 12 hour day, I'm working a 14, 15, 16 hour day. And then instead of eight hours of sleep, you get four hours of sleep. And right. I'll just keep out running this. And at some point it's going to catch up, but it never does because it doesn't have to be like that. The work has to be distributed. And I definitely, that, that, that was a painful learning lesson. And I don't think that that's something that comes natural. That's something that has to be learned. That's a great answer. Um, number two, what's one thing you are reading, listening to, or watching that's inspiring you that you would share with others? Well, I just read this for, I think the fifth time, uh, Bob Iger's book, The Ride of a Lifetime. I'm reading a lot of things on the, the future of work, the future of AI. Um, there's a book that I just read about the metaverse um, by uh, Kathy, I forget what her last name is in the, in, Brian, something who was the uh, chief evangelist for Salesforce, Brian Solis. Oh, Brian Catherine, Solis. I love Brian Solis. Catherine Hackle is the uh, author of the other one. But that's in the technology piece. But in terms of the best well-rounded story I've read in a long time is Bob Iger's Ride of a Lifetime. He talks about Marvel. He talks about Pixar. He talks about the journey that he went on with Steve Jobs and how Steve Jobs closed that deal and the lessons that Steve Jobs taught him and that Steve Jobs' concerns about Disney's culture interfering with Pixar's culture and how to just empower really talented people to do what it is that they, they do, which I've been fortunate you know, the where I'm at now, it's not about management and leadership. It's about moving roadblocks. And it's not like they work for me. It's the Steve Jobs quote, I let them tell me what to do. And I right. just constantly keep asking them, what are we missing? Where do we need to go? Check this out. This is something I saw in another industry. What do you think? Like you said, how could this apply to our business? And Bob Iger, at the end of that book, he says a lot of profound things, especially the last appendix, he goes through all of his rules to live by, which are powerful. I've listened to those probably a hundred times, but, but the most interesting thing is how he decided to go away from just pure animation into Disney plus, and instead of licensing that to Netflix and other streaming services, how did he build that with the existing staff? And I think there's so right. many parallels to our business in that, and a bunch of people that were, the pay plans were tied to legacy systems. Mm -hmm. They had archaic uh, infrastructure. They didn't, you know, they pay, they spent a billion dollars to overhaul their parks from 09 to 2020. But not just that, they were also building a whole new platform and figuring out how do you pay them on this that doesn't exist yet? Then it's not going to be profitable for two or three years. Right. While still keeping your foot, you know, over here, making sure you don't get sacked. Like you were talking about earlier, there's so many parallels in that book to this whole conversation. So f I listened to that book. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big Bob Iger fan. It's a great, it's a great book. It was definitely something I listened to and I, and I really loved it. Um, you traveled a lot. Um, so where's a place that you would love to travel that you haven't been to yet? Bora Bora. Hmm. That's a nice one. No one's ever said that. Uh, that's one I like. Um, okay. If I took all of your friends, close friends, family, people who really know you put them in a room and said, describe Brian in one word, what's the word they would use to best describe you? That's a tough one. There'd be mm -hmm. a lot of different ones. Um, <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> right. Um, my wife would say a lot, but I don't, I would say, um, determined stubborn i would say there's a lot of words uh okay it's all right but yeah okay gotcha all right last question we talked about a lot of things and again i want to thank you for taking the time this has been really a lot of fun um if you hope that the people who are listening to this take one thing away from it what's the one thing you hope they uh really embrace that you mine for conflict to chip away to, to get down to the minerals, which you know, the gold, which is trust. If if I 
could go back and, it, you know, you and I are both in the situation, right? Same situation. We're trying to pay it forward and teach mm-hmm. these lessons. And I know I was talking recently that, you know, Grant Cardone told me in 2011, you need to get big into social media. I'm telling you, it's going to be like an, like the ABC, CBS, and I'm not listening to him. And he said, I'm going to use it to build a real estate empire. I go, Grant, come on, man. That's a little <laughs> out there. And, but his, his vision was bigger than mine and he just, uh, I didn't see it, right? So a lot of people listening to this are not gonna see what we're talking about until years later. Right. You know, when they're ready to receive the message. And I, would, I just wasn't ready to receive the message at that point. But if I could go back in time in every situation I've been, which I have no regrets, just lessons learned, I would make sure to over correct in mind to make sure that everybody trusts each other. And, cause you can tell. When you when everybody leaves a room, you can tell based on their body language, their facial expressions, right? If they're bought in or if they're not, and you got a decision at that moment: do you just let them walk out the door and just pretend it didn't happen, or do you say, "Hold on a second, catch the door, sit down, we're starting over"? And most people don't want to go through that pain. Oh, we've already been in here for an hour. Well, we're going to be in here until we're on the same page, and it's okay for you to disagree with each other. Mm-hmm. It's but it's not okay to not talk about that and then walk out of here with artificial harmony. That's not, that's out of bounds. Right. And my mining for conflict prevents all the conflict. It's counterintuitive, but you've got to just keep on grinding and grinding. And if somebody doesn't have ethical and personal trust, forget about the, the, you know, cause most people focus on technical trust. That's the right. least important of the three. So that's what I would go back. Anytime I've been in a bad situation, drama, I'm like, why did I even, you know, why did I let that, why didn't I do that sooner? It always came down to that. That's great. Uh, Unbelievable. Man, thank you again. Listen, Brian, I appreciate your time. This is, uh, I hope everybody just listens to this multiple times because it is just so rich with a lot of things that uh, really, and, and also I appreciate the tactical, you know, a lot of times people talk in theory, but you really dove deep into some tactical things. So how do people connect with you? Where do they find you on social media? How do they connect? Because I'm sure some people will want to reach out and, you know, pick your brain. So where do they, where do they find you? I'm on LinkedIn under Brian Kramer. I'm on YouTube under Brian Kramer. Uh, Instagram, Kramer Brian. Facebook, Brian Kramer FL. I'm on TikTok as uh, Kramer Brian, which is, if somebody would have told me a year ago that I'd be on TikTok and that it would be taken off like it is, I would, like many other things, tell me we're crazy. That's one of those things I have to... I have to do, except my kids always laugh that you are not allowed to be there as if I'm going to embarrass their uh, their friends. Yeah. So anyway, I I friended all of their friends. There you go. So I'll link all of these up. So again, folks, if you're listening, Brian will take the time. He will connect. He is that type of person that will, you know, help you out. He is is truly one of the people who will pay it forward. So again, thank you so much, Brian. Folks, audience, you know the drill. Please make sure if you have anyone in your network that could benefit from what Brian just shared with you, please make sure you share this out to them. Uh, it, it's really important. Um, you make sure that you rate the podcast and you subscribe. That helps us, you know, spread our message out because the goal of this always has been to help you when you're in that situation and you're leading and you say to yourself, great, I'm in charge, but now what the heck do I do? Well, we're here every single week with a guest that's gonna give you some tactical tips to help you become the leader that you want to be. So thank you so much. I know there's a lot of places that you can listen to content, but the fact you spent some time with Brian and me, I hope you found value. I know we did. We had a great time. So I hope you did too. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. And Brian, once again, thanks so much. Thank you.